Thanks very much. I'll just wait for my presentation to appear. So that, that telescope that you saw at the beginning, that's our giant radio telescope at Jodrell Bank. And the voice you heard is the voice of an astronomer at Jodrell Bank in the 1950s, speaking into a microphone, turning that into a radio signal, projecting it from a telescope, bouncing it off the moon and catching the echo. So what you heard was the sort of delay pedal that's about 380,000 kilometers long. Light, light and radio waves travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. So there's a one and a quarter second tra trip time out to the moon and a one and a quarter second trip time back. So you get that two and a half second delay in that, in that sound there. Um, what I want to tell you about um, today is that sound and others like it, uh, which are basically sounds from space. And it's a project that I worked on with a couple of record producers, Jim Spencer and Dave Tolan, um, and something that we did at, at Kendall Collin in the, in the Tim Peaks Diner. Um, back in 2014. And if you're interested in the track that we'll play a little bit of at the end, um, you can download it from our website. Um, just, just Google Hello Moon free download or something and you'll probably, you'll probably find it. Um, you might wonder why we're doing these sorts of things. Well, um, it's because um, we've worked with our friends at Kendall Calling for some time now, um, particularly on the Live from Jodrell Bank series of shows that we've done a few years ago and fingers crossed coming back uh, this coming summer. Um, and for us, for, for scientists like myself uh, at Jodrell Bank, what's important about doing that is not just putting on a music festival um, because we don't just want to be another music festival. What we want to do is talk to people about our science. Uh, and what we want to do is not preach to the converted, which a lot of science centres have the problem of, is that you basically get people who are already interested coming in there. And, you know, we, what we really want to do is talk to people who would never otherwise think of coming and, uh, and visiting us. So a music festival is a great way of doing that because you get a different audience. They're there for the music. When they arrive, you lock the doors and don't let them out until you've told them some science. Um, so that's what we do. Um, so um, so this, this particular project uh, sort of arose out of, I, I did um, something uh, from the stage in one of the live from Jodrell Bank events uh, when we had uh, Sigur Ross on and I talked, played, played some of these sounds from space and then chatting to, uh, to, to Nick Fraser who runs the, uh, the Tim Peaks Dino with Tim Burgess and uh, we were thinking of something to do at Kendall and came up with this um, idea. Um, the great thing about these gigs at Jodrell is that there's our telescope there that you'll see um, sitting as a very nice projection screen. It's only 76 metres across, 250 feet in old money, the same height as the Big Ben Clock Tower. Um, this is while New Order were playing a few years ago. Uh, funnily enough, it makes an excellent mounting point for a giant bright green laser, as you can see from that photograph as well we discovered, which was highly entertaining. Um, Here's the telescope na is named after this gentleman. This is Bernard Lovell, Sir Bernard Lovell. Um, this photograph was taken a, a few years ago. He, he died at the age of uh, 98 back in, back in 2012. And you might think, you know, would he be happy about his telescope being used for that sort of thing? He actually would be. He was very engaged with talking to other people about his science. He was, very, you know, an early sort of science communicator, if you like, the Brian Cox of his time, perhaps, of the, of the, 19, of the 1960s. So, uh, so he loved that sort of thing as well. I mean, he's, he was a bit more of a fan of the Halle Orchestra than New Order, I have to admit. But, uh, but yeah, he, he loved this sort of stuff. Uh, he came to Jodrell Bank in 1945, 70 years ago this year, um, 70 years ago in December, um, and within 12 years they'd built this. This was unique in the world, um, the Lovell Telescope, um, the largest telescope in the world at the time, still the third largest telescope. If you've not been to Jodrell, please, please do, you should go and have a look at it now. Um, here it is in 1957 when it opened. Um, coincidentally, uh, that same week that it was near, near enough finished, um, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite. Um, into space, um, Sputnik 1. And here's Sputnik and the sound of Sputnik. 
That sort of sort of beach ball size thing that goes ping was sort of orbiting the earth, um, demonstrating the supremacy of the Soviet Union's uh, political system to the rest of the world. Um, but we weren't interested in tracking that, 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 that beach ball. What we were interested in was tracking the missile um, that carried um, Sputnik into space. So in fact, the first thing that telescope did was to use a, with, with a radar, was to track that rocket as it also orbited the earth because the next thing it launched might not be a, a beach ball going ping, it might be something rather more, rather more threatening. Um, and that actually led Jodrell into this whole sort of space tracking era of these sorts of, uh, picking up these sorts of sounds, these radio signals from space. Um, so one of the first things we did was to work with, we worked with the Soviet Union, we tracked the, the Sputnik rocket, um, we also um, tracked a number of their other missions. Um, they, um, they, they, they had the capability to launch rockets, um, but they didn't have the capability to track them. So Jodrell, completely coincidentally, we built this big telescope. It was the only thing in the world that could track these rockets. So we actually did that on behalf of the, on behalf of the Soviet Union. Um, this sound that you'll hear now is from our archives. Um, it's, the, it's the sound of the Luna 2 rocket, the very first rocket to, to ever hit the moon in, in 1959. radio signal being sent out by that spacecraft and picked up by that telescope at Jodrell Bank. And when those beeps stopped, that was when the spacecraft hit the moon and that was the very first uh, instrument, very first thing we'd ever sent to another celestial body back in, back in 1959. Um, the Americans were obviously, you know, wanting to be in on the game as well. You know, they want, they didn't want the the the, the Russians to uh, uh, to have all the fun here in this in this sort of space race. So they sent uh, they sent this team of Americans. This is the American Space Technology Laboratories team worked at Jodrell Bank in the late 1950s and early 60s. Again, using that telescope at Jodrell because it was unique at that time um, to track their own spacecraft. Um, they weren't very good at it, actually, the Americans. They were not as good as the Russians. The Russians were the first to put something in space, the first to hit the moon, the first to send a human into space, and so on. And this is a recording, again, from our archives of one of the American team here uh, talking about their space tracking work at Jodrell Bank. Ah, which doesn't work. So they were still searching. Most of the rockets, when they tried to hit the moon, they missed by 100,000 miles, actually. That was a, anyway, they did get better eventually. So we carried on sort of working in between these two great superpowers, really, a bit of a difficult situation right through the whole Cuban Missile Crisis when our telescope was the only uh, early warning system the UK had for, for missile attack at probably the closest time we ever came to a, to a nuclear war. Um, in 1966, we actually tracked a, a spacecraft that the Russians sent. They landed it on the moon. It was a robotic spacecraft. Um, didn't have people on it, um, but it, was, it landed on the moon. It took a photograph of the surface of the moon, and it sent it back to Earth in the form of a radio signal. Uh, we eavesdropped on that. We basically hacked into that signal. Somebody noticed that the signal was in the form of a fax machine. Um, so they said, it sounds like one of these newfangled fax machines. They were very rare. Um, we put out a call. The Daily Express answered the call and sent one up from London um, to Jodrell, plugged in the fax machine into the back of the telescope, and out of the fax machine um, came the very first picture ever sent from the surface of the moon, uh, which made it onto the Daily Express the next page. Rather annoyed the Russians, because uh, we'd scooped their, uh, their science. But anyway, there we go. So hacking into, hacking into Russian signals and printing them on fax machines is uh, part of what was done at the time. Um, sort of bringing it a bit more up to date, these are, these are signals from a spacecraft um, called the Huygens Lander. Um, a few years ago, it landed on this, uh, uh, the largest moon of Saturn, this is. Um, it has a very dense atmosphere, uh, very interesting because the chemistry is probably similar to what it was on the Earth a long time ago when, uh, when life started on Earth. And so you can't see through to the surface, but we drop this lander through the clouds, sort of floating down with a parachute onto the surface, uh, taking photographs as it went. And in order to know where that thing is relative to the surface, what you do is you send out a radio pulse 
from the, from the spacecraft down to the ground and you catch the echo and you measure the time taken just like the hello moon thing at the beginning and the time it takes tells you how far away you are. So what you'll hear in a minute from these recordings of these sounds um, is, is initially there's a sort of locking on signal um, but then you get this sort of series of beeps, so sort of sort of noise with the beeps sort of going backwards and forwards. And as it gets closer, the pitch of that sound increases uh, as it gets closer to the surface. It's just locking on. hear the pitch going up as this thing sort of floats its way down. Getting a lot close to the surface now. Landed. <laughs> so. Which is one of the most hilarious sounds ever, I think. Okay, right. uh, so this is these are the photographs it took. This the photograph on the left is the one that was taken sort of through its feet as it was sort of going down through the atmosphere, and then the one on the right is a photograph of the surface of Titan taken by that um, taken by that spacecraft. So amazing science, but sort of illustrated by these by these sounds. Um, coming a bit closer to home, um, going, I'm going through this set of sounds that are basically our database for a remix. Um, here are proton whistlers. Um, that are basically caused by lightning here on Earth. They send out a plasma wave through the Earth's magnetic field um, where electrons sort of go out along the Earth's magnetic field and then protons are sort of kicked into motion by that same energy. And then, so what you hear is the sort of the whistle, the pew sort of noise of the, of the initial whistler. And then you hear this woo sort of ghostly proton whistler afterwards. I've been trying to sell this to George Lucas. Very Star Wars. So these things are happening in the Earth's atmosphere all the time. We can pick them up with radio telescopes. Um, an unusual signal from space now, if you point your radio telescope in any random direction in space, what you tend to hear is hiss. Um, Jocelyn Bell at the University of Cambridge back in 1967 managed to notice one of these um, things. So a particular direction in space. This is a recording from our telescope recently. So an incredibly regular. It's a flashing of a radio source just played through a set of speakers and turned into a sound. So that's sort of regular thudding. That, for all the world, that would, that would seem to be artificial. And so they called the first one Little Green Man 1 because they thought maybe it's a Little Green Man sending us a message. And then they found Little Green Man 2 and Little Green Man 3 and soon realized that it wasn't a Little Green Man at all. It was a thing called a pulsar, a dead star about the size of a city spinning around and beaming out radio waves like a lighthouse that gives that sort of flashing, a sort of cosmic lighthouse. Uh, and obviously famously featured on the Joy Division album, Unknown Pleasures, so handy artwork as well. Um, this is something I did a few years ago with a black hole. So these, these are, these are uh, actually X-ray signals from, the, from gas as it falls into a black hole in Cygnus X1. Um, and as it disappears in forever beyond the event horizon, never to return, we don't think um, it gets very hot and it produces X-rays. And you can take those observations and you can turn those into a sound. And this is what the, the black hole sounds like. The variations you're hearing are actually just the amount of stuff disappearing into the black hole is not steady. Sometimes you get a big lump of stuff fall in, sometimes less, and that changes the, the, the quality of that, of that sound. And the last example I'll just play you is an example of a sort of suite of sounds is the Big Bang. So we we'll finish with the beginning of the universe. Um, this is a map of the oldest light you'll ever see. It's the whole sky around us uh, in radio waves taken with a spacecraft called Planck. 
um, just, just very recently. And it's basically light that's been traveling through the universe ever since just, just after the Big Bang, nearly 14 billion years ago, stretched by the expansion of space. And we see the universe in that picture exactly as it was about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, about 14 billion years ago. And you can look at the details of that and you can work out what sound waves were flooding through the universe at the time. And you can recreate those sound waves but rather than sort of wait for the whole expansion of the universe to play the whole track, because I only have one minute and 47 seconds left, um, what we'll do is we'll take the first million years of the universe and we'll compress it into about 10 seconds. You'll be pleased to hear. So this is the first million years of the universe squeezed into about 10 seconds. Impressive. That sort of woo noise is actually the universe expanding, changes the quality of the sound. Um, so what did we do with, with, with Hello Moon? Well, we basically get, um, we did, we did a, a sort of workshop in the, in the, in the Tim Peaks Diner at Kendall Calling, and I, and I gave a sort of talk about the sounds, the same sort of thing as I've just done now, sort of a bit, bit longer, but explaining all the different sounds. And then Jim and uh, Dave took over and sort of said, how would you take those sorts of sounds? Some of them are rhythmic, some of them are weird. How would you take those and piece those together to make a track? Um, out of that, uh, and so they did a sort of workshop on the creation, the mixing of a, of a track. Um, and what I'll do is just for the last um, 30 seconds or so, a minute or so, I'll play you um, what they created. And there is a test on the way out where you have to say which sounds I played that you can hear in this, in this track. They added the snare drums. There's no snare drums in space. And I've been told to stop there before all the lighters you're waving about set off the sprinkler system. So thank you very much. Thank you.